Bob Bierman is my first interview on Event Yak for a couple of reasons. I met Bob about a decade ago when he was working at Bloomberg. Ever since I met him, he has been extremely open and generous with his knowledge, his insights, and his time. I seek him out not often enough to talk, but when I do, I feel really, really good afterwards. He's smart, optimistic, and most importantly, he has a global events perspective. I'm lucky to know him and to have access to him. He's a champion for and a mentor to his people and for live events as a whole. He's genuine, and he understands that hoarding information and competitiveness will kill an industry. We all have to share in best practices to help our industry. Bob is at the top of the event's food chain, and that's why I thought it was important to start here. He's the catalyst. Think of him as the spark plug in the car that ignites the gasoline, and the gasoline may be money and executive support, but he makes the whole car go. He's a job creator, and he's extremely savvy about the big stuff as well as the smaller stuff. Put it this way, he knows the difference between a grip and a gaffer. Without him and people like him and their vision, we're all standing around with our hands in our pockets. In this interview, he provides a 30,000-foot look at what the future of events looks like, how to cultivate and prepare your event talent, and the importance of trying new things and possibly failing. We talk about the impacts of COVID-19 as well as how the industry in general is evolving. Stick with me as I speak with Bob Bierman. Playback ending in five. Standby fan music, standby talent. Three, two, one. Clear. Music go. Talent go. Welcome to Event Yak, where event pros share their stories about the past, present, and future. I'm your host, Terry Walters. Bob Bierman, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I um, I was thinking about when we actually met, and I had to go back through my notes. I mean, do you know how long we've we've known each other at this point? Uh, we actually met during the Great Recession of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, when I was at Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's been a good uh, ten years or so at this point. It has been exactly uh, ten years. I uh, I did my first meeting um, with Holly Duran. Um, in uh, October of 2010, mm -hmm. and I soon I met you soon afterwards. So, um, so that's that. Um, we'll talk about um, Bloomberg and and some of this other stuff we have going on here um, in a few seconds. But um, I kind of just want to set the stage here, um, like how, like what I did there. <laughs> um, um, so you've called yourself a convener. Uh huh. And I love that. Um, and that's really why I wanted to interview you because it all kind of, that's where it all starts is, you know, convening. You're the guy who kind of talks with the CEOs and the business leaders who think they might want to dabble in this um, thing called experiential. Um, and um, so you light the spark and you provide value to the client and the CEO and the company, but you also create work for thousands and thousands of people who work in the live events uh, industry. So thank you for that. Hmm. And, and, um, but no pressure, um, you know, I want to get right to it. You know, what have you heard uh, as far as this COVID thing? Do you think live events are going to come back? Yeah. So um, I've heard, I've been in this business now since the early nineties and at least five times I've heard that something was going to kill the events business. And every time the answer ends up being that humans are tribal, humans are social, and humans like to gather. Sometimes they gather differently. They'll gather online or they'll gather on the phone or you know, less in person. Um, but when the opportunity arises, um, first chance they get, they're back in person again. And what COVID I think has done is it has forced businesses to be digital, whether they wanted to or not. And it's taken the politics and the um, inertia out of companies that have thought maybe they should try something um, and forced them to, to think about 
what they should be doing online and how that relates to the core business. What I believe will come of this is that um, live events will be smarter. People will come more prepared and they will have lots of different types of interactions in between the live in-person event that people weren't having before, um, but everybody's always wanted them to do. Like, like what, for example, would, would that look like, do you think? Like sure. Activisions? Yeah, so I think um, I'll give you an example. At, um, at G100 Network, which is a membership-driven network that we do in-person meetings for our members and have never really done a whole lot more than that, um, March 6th, so this was when people were just sort of rumoring about um, travel restrictions and maybe some people would work from home. We sent a note to all of our chief human resource officer members and said, hey, if you want to, we'll do a call on Friday and you can just sort of compare notes. Um, that Friday, we had 60 of our CHRO members show up from Fortune 1000 companies. They wanted to get together and sort of compare notes on things like, hey, are you doing travel restrictions yet? Is it just, uh, you know, China and Italy? You know, very specific answers like that. On a lark, we said, hey, you want to do this again next week? So fast forward five weeks later, this has become a standing weekly call. And the, um, the content has changed over time where it's a little bit less of what's in front of people and it's a lot more talking about the future and sort of learning new skills and um, taking this as an opportunity for people who would normally gather in person to gather in a different way. What, what I believe will end up happening is these will become monthly calls. People can't sustain a weekly cadence. And what I already know is happening is people are urgent to get together in person. They've gotten to know each other better. They've gotten to know each other as human beings during a challenging time. And the natural outcropping of that is people then want to break bread together. And, you know, later this year, they'll do that. And they will have had they will have had a pre-existing relationship over time that allows them to join each other in the middle of a conversation in person rather than saying hello in person for the first time. Do you uh, like, so you're, you're probably doing this like in some zoom kind of fashion. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people are doing that. Do you find that um, the networking component is lacking at all? I mean, to me, it, it just mm -hmm. kind of does. It's, it's different. So, so you can't, you can't replace a handshake or, or an elbow bump um, with <laughs> a, um, with a hello and a smile on, on a digital platform. Um, but what you can do is if, if you're able to create, we're using zoom. Um, if you're okay. able to create an environment where people are honest with each other, um, and where people start to trust each other over time, we've watched sort of over the past five weeks, we've watched people become increasingly comfortable with each other. And now we've met people's dogs, their kids, we've seen the insides of their houses. Um, so when you talk about networking, it's a different type of intimacy with people um, than you would have in a professional environment um, where people are in person together. It still is something that ends up being a demand creator for that in-person interaction because it, it, just, it just isn't the same um, to convene sort of by voice or by video as it is to have that sort of face-to-face -face interaction, um, to be able to have that hallway conversation, to look someone in the eye and know whether anybody else is listening um, and have a conversation about things that matter most to you in that moment. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to, I think it's going to be funny for everybody. Um, you know, the, the people are talking today about the fact that from the waist down, nobody really knows, you know, kind of what <laughs> people are wearing, you know, you can have your sweatpants on your bunny slippers. Uh, so people are going to have a hard time going back to the mm -hmm. office, I think, um, with that. Um, do you think, um, like, for, I think the, this isn't the first time really that events has come to a kind of a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you and I have, you know, this is not our first rodeo, I like to say. Um, do you think that, um, the live events industry kind of needs to do anything better 
um, or something better? How do we support each other? Um, and is that possible? You know, mm. this is one of the reasons I really wanted to to do this show because I think that you know we are a very broad um, group, and a lot of times we work in different silos, and we only come together when there's something going on for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and when um, there's something going on for us, like this situation where the entire place is just, you know, our entire industry is completely stalled. What can we do, do you think, to, to help that in the future? Um, this is one of those times that is, um, it's a time when cliches are proven true. And what I would say in this case is the rising tide lifts all boats conversation. Mm -hmm. And in the live events industry, the competitive nature and the high risk nature of, of live events has made people reluctant to have real conversations with each other about um, strategic issues impacting the live event product. And what that sort of means to me is one, the exchange of sort of what's working and not, wor not working, um, sort of talking about formats and ways to deliver events that, that people are trying, um, sharing those ideas has never been more important. Um, at the end of the day, there are certain best practices that will emerge. They're not going to be competitive advantages. They're going to be industry best practices. Okay. And sharing those things now um, is one thing. Second, for those who are in the position that that I'm in, who are um, the the businesses that convene people mm -hmm. and that contract um, help and that have workers who are in sort of the event world, um, this is a time to think about the long term relationship, and um, it's not a time to. Um, it's not a time to beat up vendors and look for the last nickel. It's a time to remember those who have been with you all along and help them through um, just as they will help you through when the, when the industry comes back around. And that goes for um, hourly workers. It goes for full-time event workers. Um, it goes for contractors. Um, th this is a time to remember who's in your ecosystem. Remember it's a small world and that they'll talk when this is all over. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody, uh, there's a lot of time for people to talk during events. Yeah, exactly. um, that's for sure. Even, even the people behind the scenes. Um, I'm glad that you said that because um, I think that that's, a, that's an important point. And I think a lot of people need to hear it, um, especially from, you know, a guy who puts a lot of stuff together um, and at a very high level. Um, I want to shift gears just a second and, um, you know, I want to paint a little bit more of your background. Um, I want you to give me the um, what, what I'm calling the Thanksgiving dinner pitch um, <laughs> about uh, like it's always hard for me to describe to my my friends and my family what I do. So I say, you know, here's the Thanksgiving dinner pitch, which is a little bit longer than the elevator pitch and a little let a little less long than the let's have a glass of wine at the bar pitch. <laughs> so tell me what you're doing at G1 uh, G100 there. Um, so yeah, this is the, uh, um, when I first got into this business, my dad said, is that full-time work? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and my, my, uh, mission in life is to finally be able to answer what I do for a living. Um, so I'll give you the, the, um, the short version of the progression of how I got here, which will help explain mm -hmm. what this is. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I started my career in the, in the mega trade show business, um, as a general manager at Comdex. So those were um, tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands of people with multiple thousands of exhibitors and um, sort of the very big tent interactions. And as the general manager, um, I always described it as the orchestra conductor um, who pulls together the marketing, the sales, um, the operations aspect, um, all of the different pieces that go into um first conceiving and then second delivering an event and monetizing it. And as the general manager, you sort of do everything and do nothing um, because you're the it's, person it's in the funny. middle of all that. 
It's funny you say that because I, I, as a producer and as a show caller, I say the exact same thing. You're kind of the maestro. You're kind of telling people, directing people, mm -hmm. showing people, and um, and not to interrupt you, but um, but yeah, it's a kind of very similar um, kind of thing on a different level. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. So yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, and and on that point, one of the big challenges is um, nobody ever won an Olympic gold medal making a sport look difficult, and that's the challenge <laughs> in events as well. It's like if you're good at what you do. Um, you can actually look quite calm and lazy and people mistake that sometimes, um, that, uh, don't go blowing our secrets there, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the, um, so from the trade show business, um, I had, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to move into the media world, which is where I had always wanted to be in the first place, um, running the global conference business for fortune. And, that was um, media driven conferences with people who are at the very top of their game, CEOs, world leaders, sort of household name types of people um, and delivering sort of high value premium conferences around the world, um, which I then sort of took to um, my next sort of stop at Bloomberg with the financial world and the things that they care about. And then at the Washington Post. Um, with the editorial events business there. Um, what, what that progression taught me is that um, the more curated the interactions and the more sort of thoughtful the relationship that a brand has with its customers, the better the events will be. Um, which then brings me to G100 Group, which is a 100% member-driven, um, member-funded network of networks. So we have um, CEO members who are part of our CEO network. Um, we have uh, CHROs who are the chief human resource officers who are members of that network, um, senior management team members who are members of a few networks, and a women's platform for rising VPs and C-suite women from large companies. Um, they convene in person twice a year, each of the groups. Um, and then we also um, deliver other benefits to them um, as part of their membership. It's, it's interesting because it's the culmination of what I believe is at the center of a great event business, even though this is only partially an event business. And that is, um, it's about having a relationship with the community, understanding what they care about, um, facilitating the interactions between those people and between the core sort of value that you bring to them. And then eventually saying, Hey, you want to get together? Um, and that's what this business is, is um, a community that needs to sort of interact with each other peers who have answers that other peers can answer. Um, and eventually that they just can't stand to not answer in person with each other a couple times a year. And and because it's member driven, I mean, people are kind of putting their money where their mouth is. I mean, they they come up and they come in and they bring things with them. But also, you need to be able to provide them with something as well. There's kind of a give and take relationship there. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think what's what's interesting is as sponsor and exhibitor dollars get more difficult, um, and as registration fees um, sort of get more difficult, um, which those are cycles, by the way. Um, the the marketing budgets and sort of audience sort of registration budgets um, sort of come and go in, inside the consumer side of the business. And right now where we are is um, at this point where it's it's challenging to get the marketing dollar and challenging to get the registration fee. Um, what the what the membership model does is it takes the drama out of that and puts us in a situation where we know that we are responsible for delivering value to someone for a 12 month period and finding the best ways to, to deliver that value um, without having to think about the transaction every time we interact with them. How do you cultivate that membership? Like to me, like it's always, uh, I find a lot of people find it really, really difficult. Like you were saying to fill seats. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you cultivate that relationship with the target audience that you have? So I think there are, um, there's a lot of, uh, it's sort of relationships and magic, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, um, for, for, 
for event producers, for conveners who are bringing a lot of people together. And when they've done it over a period of years where they kind of know who it is that is their recurring participant, that's the pod. So if you, if you have an event where you're bringing, you know, 10,000 people together Mm -hmm. and over time you find that 20% of them have come three or five years in a row, Mm -hmm. you start looking at that audience and saying, you know what, I might be able to have a different relationship with them where they assume that they're doing business with me and I can put a membership sort of structure together where um, we can both assume that that relationship's there next year too. Um, so by, by looking at that, that's, that's one of the best indicators where you can still run your 10,000 person event and um, pursue registrations and pursue sort of sponsorship dollars, but then start to look at how you um, curate pods of, of groups within that larger audience who might want to have a deeper interaction, a more frequent interaction, and a higher value interaction um, with each other and with the product that you provide. That's interesting. So you kind of segment the audience and serve, you know, you'll have the main, like a main conference or a main event, and then you'll have specific um, uh, pieces that, that work for certain individuals or certain groups. So I think that's a, that's an interesting concept. Yeah. I mean, in, in any, any event of scale is really a, a collection of very small audience segments who add up to a larger one. Um, so that's one way. The other way the, so G100, what's interesting about this company is um, it started as a group of CEOs who wanted to talk to each other about doing business away from the glare of media, away from sort of all of the sort of politics and news headlines and that sort of thing. So it's Jack Welch, A.G. Laffley, um, Ken Langone, sort of very Some big, heavy hitters. well-known CEOs. Yeah. Um, who wanted somewhere to meet. Um, So they started doing this. Then more people wanted to be part of it. As they made more friends and invited them in, it became bigger. Then that was um, acquired by the current owners about 17 years ago, who turned that into a business model. Um, Okay. So that's sort of the, the grassroots of an alpha consumer <laughs> um, or a group of alpha consumers um, who sort of grow from a core into something larger versus having something very large and trying to um, find niches within a larger pool of people who you can sort of put into a sort of membership like format. It's, it's um, it kind of mirrors the whole subscription kind of um, um, economy that we have right now. It just kind of makes sense, you know, and you as a consumer, the person as a consumer can either, you know, say yes or, or say no, you know, based on the product that you're offering. So, um, and like you say, it gives you the ability to see what you have coming in so that you can structure your events, um, accordingly for that. Yeah. And it's, and what it, what it does is, um, you're now talking about a recurring revenue business, Mm -hmm. Um, like a subscription business or like a Mm -hmm. software as a service business, you know, it's a recurring revenue business versus a one-off transactions. Um, And well, that's good for, that's good for everybody because, you know, it's now, you know, you can look at a, you know, anybody who participates. And again, I'm, you know, the show is for multiple uh, um, people within events. It's like, at least you can look at your book. of I could look at my book of business and say, okay, well, Bob's got this. and, And you look at your book of business and you can say, we've got this and we can, um, we can um, leverage that mm-hmm. in certain ways. So I think that that's a, a great thing, a great evolution. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And, and what it does is it, it underscores um, this moment in time, this COVID moment, um, which is the, any great event business is centered on understanding who you are to the audience you're trying to convene. And having a membership or a subscription type mentality that says, I'm delivering something that is worth money over and over and over again to a group of people who are my customers, um, forces an event producer to think about um, 
what what value do I provide to this community? And what, who am I to them? Who are they to me? And if you are working inside of a company like that, it it causes you to think about how the role that you play inside of that company adds value to your audience. And if you are a, um, let's say that you're a service provider pitching a company, um, being able to come in and say, here's what this does that adds value to the fee that your audience is paying right. you. Right. So it's a different right. mindset from the sort of um, where events were sort of grew up for a very long time as a marketing um, sort of funded business still is, um, but being able to really have a robust um, sort of consumer revenue line is increasingly important, whether you're in the media business or the event business. It's it's extremely targeted on specific um, segments, which I, I find very strong. I mean, it's, you know, it, it uh, when it, even in podcasting, they say you need to find your niche mm -hmm. and the more you niche down, um, the the more eventually uh, interested people you're going to find. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. And that's so um, a, uh, a media business lesson. Um, that's what's been happening <laughs> in the media world. Um, All right. So, so the, the gifts of digital technology have created a demand by customers to be treated in increasingly customized ways. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what's happened with large media companies, um, New York Times has a whole collection of blogs, of newsletters, of other ways of sort of finding those niches within their sort of multi-million um, reader base. Um, Washington Post, same thing. Finding those buckets of, of audience within that larger audience and targeting products to them that feel customized. And that's a trend that is... Um, for audience driven businesses like a media business, it's a trend that translates directly to the event business. Um, cause yet again, in person, people are increasingly looking for that customized experience that's just for them. And for, no and it's not exactly the same for two people, but you can at least narrow it down to where it is, um, where you've identified niches and sort of delighted that niche of people as as well as possible um, versus treating them all like sort of one giant demographic within an event pool. Yeah. I mean, um, you, you mentioned you were at fortune and you were at um, the Washington post and those are all kind of legacy mm -hmm. um, brands. And, and I think, you know, they have all evolved to this place where you're talking about mm -hmm. right now, but I think it, it was a long road for mm -hmm. them. I mean, um, you know, they first started to go into this experiential thing and it was a big experiment. It seemed like, you know, um, you know, you, you, when you were at fortune, it, that's kind of when you started to become kind of, I would consider like a change agent. Mm -hmm. You're the kind of guy who comes in, looks at what the situation is and says, here's where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and fortune, I mean, and any magazine, I work with a couple of other like legacy brands and magazines. Um, they, 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 they decided, I, I don't know if it was just because they needed revenue or they saw that they were going to become go the way of the dinosaur or what, but they went into this experiential thing. Mm -hmm. Like, why why did that, other than, like, the the money, and maybe the money is just just the thing. Yeah. Why, why did they go into that? It's a business they weren't really mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's funny because the media industry has a way of um, – jumping in and leaving the event business for all the wrong reasons. Um, Fortune is one that got mm -hmm. into it for all the right reasons. And, and I can say that confidently and with pride because I was not there when they started. Um, so Fortune got into this business as a way of, of deepening relationships with um, sources, um, with advertisers, as having a, a more value added stickier relationship with the readers and advertisers um, who were part of the magazine's world. Um, that was 1994. Um, when I joined in 2003, the internet bubble had burst. 9-11 had happened. Mm -hmm. Like all of the things that were supposed to yet again sort of kill this business. Mm -hmm. um, 
had created a situation for Fortune to say, you know what, maybe we need to start looking at this as more of a structured business um, than as something that has sort of ancillary benefit. Um, so I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and with the right skills, having come from the commercial side of the event business, um, to start to guide that business towards something that actually had a meaningful audience and sponsorship revenue model separate from um, advertising value add and um, free attendance for people attending. Um, it, it was challenging early on because in the media world, there's always this debate about what relationship um, an editorial organization should have with its readers. And at the time, the logic was we can't charge people because then you're putting a financial relationship in between you and people who you might have to cover later. Um, so, so that was all the right reasons um, for creating this because it was it was a strategic brand building, value building exercise um, for Fortune as a brand. And you know, I would argue that they've continued on even as the business has grown substantially. Um, over the past um, sort of 15 years, I guess, since I left or so. Um, mm -hmm. the I guess it's only been 10. Um, the, uh, <laughs> they've, they've kept that um, focus on being sort of the convening brand for people who have made it to the top and look around and can't find anybody to talk to. Um, where media companies have made mistakes um, in going into this business is when they get too focused on um, customized events where they are, it, those are important, they need to happen, but sometimes they can over index towards um, advertiser funded, funded events that are strictly about um, cost plus a percentage um, to run an event on behalf of an advertiser or where a media brand has gotten into the event business strictly for the P&L. Um, those are the two sort of primary mistakes that um, you've seen media brands make, which is why you'll see um, big media brands staff up, say that they're relaunching this business, that they're going all in, and then sort of three years later, it's a sort of three to five year cycle versus the usual event business five to seven year cycle. Um, of saying, ooh, we're sort of pulling back now and trying to save money on our event business. Um, so, so understanding that events are their own product, that they are their own type of editorial content, and that they are their own unique high value relationship with a community are all the right reasons to do it. And by the way, it can be great money too if you get that right. So you should do it for the right reason and, you know, do what you love and the money will follow, as they say, kind of thing. You can you can do what you love or you can do all the right things and find a way to love what you do. Either way works. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about networking before, and um, I, I have seen companies now who have been really, really successful at kind of commoditizing networking. Mm -hmm. Um, they do these like speed dating things. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that they, they hype during their events. You know, they have a, a bunch of you know, really good people on stage and I want to talk about that, but the networking components of a lot of these, especially these tech companies, um, has become really a big part of it and something that they really hype up even in, uh, gathering registrants. How did, how did that all come about? And, and what do you, what do you make of all of that? So um, in my opinion, that was born of the first dot-com revolution. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it was born... Yeah, the first one. Yeah, um, <laughs> sort of the pets.com and Yahoo era. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, you had these mega trade shows. So that was the world mm -hmm. I was in. And you would have people would say, oh, it's all become a bunch of tire kickers. And, you know, the fear that everyone had in the mega trade show business was... Um, take the biggest 10 exhibitors and the whole thing collapses. Um, Good point. Good point. And um, the other was if we're perceived as being sort of low value, high volume um, participants, then um, people are going to start to, it, it'll start to erode the premium that you can charge for people to attend and for trade show exhibitors to buy a booth. Um, so um, 
lo and behold, um, expensive sort of overbuilt matchmaking tools came on the scene um, to help trade show participants be more efficient about how they were spending their time and to be sort of the first round of trying to segment trade show audiences. And it was more sort of like you go into, you know, you take the database of participants, it's sort of searchable. You might have a few, you know, search by title, search by company or by state, you know, some way of doing that. Um, I would argue that those got way better after 9-11 and the dot-com crash um, because people got very value conscious about where they were spending the most valuable commodity they had, and that's time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now people needed to take the tools that they had um, that had been developed during the first dot com era and apply those to this problem of adding value to participants who wanted to know what they were going to get for their money. Um, so now now suddenly you are getting a lot more focused about how you connect people with each other um, through using Internet interfaces um, tagging people in lots right. of different funky ways so that they can find each other in ever, you know, smaller sort of customized groups um, and putting people together that way. At the end of the day, it's all about facilitating commerce and introductions between people. And over time, um, the participant and the, the sponsor have become increasingly demanding on making sure that they're meeting the people they want to meet and fewer of the people they don't want to meet. Same thing that happens online with internet advertising or anything else. It's like people just Mm -hmm. want to go straight to the good stuff. Okay. (laughs) Um, And that's so, so, you know, that's where then you see sort of this era of um, venture capitalists um, sort of introducing startups to other investors um, right. startup events, introducing, um, startups to investors and, you know, the buyer seller sort of events that were sort of all about sort of making a connection between sort of people who needed to know each other as quickly as they possibly can. Okay. Um, so I find that you, you know, throughout the years, I, I've looked at the people you have on the main stage as well. The networking component is one thing. Mm-hmm. The main stage um, is always an important thing, too. Now, how would you tell someone who's getting into this business? It, it's, it seems like it's a hard thing to get really good um, influencers, I guess you would say, mm-hmm. but also to get interviewers as well. Mm-hmm. Like, how how were you able to... Because you've kind of gone from place to, to from one place to another, how have you taught your teams, and how do you actually do that? It just seems like it's talk about magic. I mean, um, it's it's hard. I know, and I know there's like logistically trying to stack that up, and everybody's um, timing and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. How do you make that kind of a thing work, and still have somebody who knows what they're talking about mm-hmm. on the stage? So there there are two aspects of that. One is the actual speaker selection, and the sort of the entry level is go get as famous a person as you can and you can't fail. Um, okay. And uh, not, not true because you can have, you know, famous people and they're, you know, true. boring yeah. and not, not right. You know, I mean, okay. That's, so go ahead. I'm so with and, you so and far. I'm telling you, the, I'm telling you the logic, not the, what works. Um, oh, okay. And, um, and then, so to me, what's important is, um, there are, there are people who, when you put them on a program and promote it, they encourage people to attend. And then there are the people who might be less famous, who you put on stage because they're great, and it makes people glad they came. And, yes. okay. and that's why you can't gamble everything on, I'm going to go get a famous person, because that person might get them there, but they might not make someone glad they came. Um So then it's an interesting, (laughs) uh, interesting insight, really, because I've sat through meetings and I've, uh, you know, here's, you know, this guy, this guy, they're all they've got the biggest Twitter following. You've got they've got the big name. And sometimes it's the the person who you've never really heard of that that knocks it out of the park. And you're, you know, you're just astounded. So, yeah, cool. Okay, And and then so and that's where um, if you're controlling the things you can control, um, 
which you can't control the schedules of your speakers and that sort of thing. But what you can control is the questions they're asked and what you hope to get out of them on stage. So, so for me, um, I look at preparing moderators and preparing sessions the same way that you would look at preparing a TV interviewer to go on air. And that is um, having great research that is then summarized into brief notes and a set of possible questions that an interviewer could ask that takes a, that takes a session um, and breaks it into sort of two or three different parts. So you supply that for your interviewers. You find an mm-hmm. interviewer who, you know, kind of has it going on, but they still need to have the research, the producer kind of behind it. That's, that's right. So even, even the best, so I've worked with journalists quite a bit for most of my career as interviewers. And, you know, let's be honest, some journalists have personalities made for print. Um, others, <laughs> others maybe are more prepared for television or radio or a live um, sort of environment. The fail safe right. is to make sure that you have excellent preparation, regardless of which one of those people you end up with on stage. And if they have one okay. sheet of paper that um, one sort of clarifies the sort of tone and format of the session for them, and two, that gives them a sense of why you've invited the guests they're interviewing to be on stage. Mm-hmm. And then three, you know, a few of those points of what you would ask if you were the one doing the interview, then if you get someone who's not great at this, um, at least what they can do is um, make sure that they're asking questions and driving a session that is based on what you hoped it would be and adding whatever that expertise is that's the reason why you invited them. Like they might be brilliant on a topic, but not Mm -hmm. the greatest presenter. Um, yes. If they're driving, if they're driving a conversation based on what you hoped they would drive, and then reacting based on the knowledge that they have inside of them, then you can end up with a pretty good session anyway. I think also the whole idea of a green room um, situation is uh, a good idea too. A lot of times these speakers are you know flying in, um, you know, two seconds before they're going on stage. But if you have an opportunity to hook the an interviewer and interviewee up in a green room situation, um, that shows on the stage as well, I think, because there's a rapport yeah. that's developed. Yeah. And, it, and, that, and that green room can either be um, out of sight or it can be in sight. Um, and, and you'll remember sort of at Bloomberg, there was a period of time where we took speakers backstage and we actually broke the ice by giving them a project. You know, we had one time we basically had outlines of bears and bulls and they could color their own uh, bear and bull together and write captions in a word balloon over that. Um, At a commercial real estate conference, we had a Lego building competition in the back that got sort of pretty heated um, in the green room. And it was it was an icebreaker beforehand for people to pay attention to something else while they were talking to each other to prepare. Yeah, loosen up. We also then we took it out into the open sometimes as well where speakers and interviewers would arrive and the green room was a section of an open area where participants could see them there and feel like, Oh, I I got to see that person. Not that the Mm -hmm. speakers were all hidden in the back somewhere. Um, And there was, and it was also a chance for speaker and interviewer to be in um, a casual environment where they can feel like they're more chatting in a room together um, to prepare before they go on stage. And with, with journalists, that interaction that happens in the 15 to 30 minutes before the session starts is the most important for making sure you're going to have a great session because the pre-call might or might not happen. They might be reluctant to be on a pre-call. Um, you know, there are lots of reasons why no matter how hard you plan ahead, <laughs> that 15 to 30 minutes is is what's going to make the difference between success and failure on stage. It's interesting that you talk about the whole green room, um, the, the, the different ways that you've approached it and, and you, you know, you're, you do this with a lot of other uh, things as well. 
I guess, what, what would you say to people who need to try new things, mm-hmm. who are afraid to try new things? They, they go in, they have the same either um, agenda all the time or the way they do things all the time because it's worked for them in the past. Um, how, how could you encourage people and even um, people who are in the technical um, portion of this industry, mm-hmm. how do you encourage people to say, go out and try something new? Especially during this time where mm-hmm. people are, you know, really in a bad place, mm-hmm. you know, mentally. So I would say um, there's no curriculum for being an event professional. Um, the curriculum is basically making a lot of mistakes. And for me, the, the most amazing opportunity I had was early in my career when I was lucky enough to become a partner in a very small trade show production company and had the opportunity to make an enormous number of mistakes in a very short period of time. And, <laughs> and also to understand that um, an event professional is basically a collection of mistakes and solutions. That's, that's an event professional. And the ability to have the courage and the Rolodex of ideas and the experience to be able to say, you know what, I can pretty much deal with anything because my business is one that when the product is delivered, there's very little I can actually control. Um, so that's one is just understand that this is a business that's about trying things and then making it work somehow. And if you're not trying new things, then you're not growing. I, I totally agree. I mean, and, and also I think you have also um, consistently built really, really good teams. How, how do you do that? I mean, how does, is that something that's just something experience? Is that kind of hit or miss? And h- how can people build good teams? And what do you look for in teammates? Um, so I mean, for me, um, hiring is excruciating for me because I, mm. I do not like to hire based on resumes. Um, I like to look for the skills in the human being and understand that someone has the, the curiosity, um, the willingness to make mistakes, um, the ability to learn, and um, that there'll be a, a fit for the type of culture that, um, that I'm trying to build. So for me, um, a team is basically a group of people who you trust to be continuous learners, who you trust to be risk takers and manage those risks and who you um, sort of trust to sort of as, as you grow a brand to sort of let go of things and let them take it over. Um, Part of that is it's a two way street. The team has to trust you as well and giving people tremendous latitude to make mistakes and giving them tremendous latitude to do things that might be your own pet peeve. Um, but if they, if they own it, love it, want to try it, want to make it work, be okay with it. Um, and the more latitude you give people and treat them like adults, um, the more people sort of grow into um, being sort of amazing teammates who support you and who support each other. I think that's a great um, insight about, your leadership style. And, and I've, I've, you know, I've watched you, I've worked with you in the past. Um, you know, just even just doing something as simple as a site inspection, you like to eyeball a place. Right. I mean, don't, don't, don't get me, you know, wrong there. You want to come in and you need to scope it out yourself, but it's like, it's like a bunch of jacks. Like, you know, you have your hand a handful of jacks and you go in and you throw them, you know, throw them out and, and they all kind of land where they, they need to, um, you know, you've got the producer over here and you've got the, you know, the tech people over here and they're doing their own thing and they're having their own side conversations. And in the end, you bring everybody back together and um, assess and, and move forward. So to me, that's a really good leader, giving people the, the latitude, hiring the right people and, and uh, giving them the latitude to do the thing that they, they love. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and to me, um, So people who know me know that I'm a person of very, of many and very strong opinions. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, um, but also that, um, that I'm willing to be respectful of other people's opinions and to let them run with that. And Mm -hmm. if you, if you can't overcome that hump of saying, I have my own opinions, but I want to trust other people to do their job. 
then you start mm-hmm. to have you have to start asking yourself, why do I have other people working here if I'm not allowed if I'm not letting them do things? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And what are and what are they getting out yeah. of it and how long are they actually gonna stay? Yeah. And um, and I think the advice for this moment in, t- in time for people who are building teams and trying to encourage risk is this COVID era, era is an incredible gift to people who have been trying to do new things, but have been too afraid to do it. I agree. There is so I much agree. permission and so much forgiveness um, to do things that are good enough or that are a first time try and sort of a little rough around the edges this is the time to place right. all those bets and then refine them and fix them sort of when the world sort of changes back to whatever normal looks like. Yeah, because it's just been um, this thing is just kind of dropped on us. Right. A lot of people will will go out and, and, and try things. And then there's some people who are really struggling, you know, um, and, and it's hard. Yeah. But I, I agree with you that my my advice is the same as yours. You know, don't be afraid. Go out and try something new and um, and learn and talk to the people, talk to your peers, talk to your, you know, family, talk to reach out and stay in touch and stay sharp because this is going to, this is going to end at some point. And I think, you know, I mean, this is, you know, as, as event professionals, I had a boss 20 years ago who, um, we, we didn't have the most amazing relationship. Um, and it started with, a very hard conversation we had right after I had run an incredibly successful event. And I was young and sort of, of course, um, sort of full of all the things young people are full of. And (laughs) he got on the call sort of with my team and immediately wanted to go to sort of like the troubleshooting part. I love that. I love that immediately. Let's (laughs) do that. And, you know, two days later, after avoiding his phone calls for two solid days on Easter Sunday, I finally pick up the phone. He sort of lets a little bit of steam off about my avoiding his calls. And then he says, you need to explain to me why this happened. And I said, here's what you don't understand. People who produce events, no matter what their exterior is like, are emotional people. Mm -hmm. We work very, very hard toward a point in time that point in time happens. And then all of a sudden it's over the human energy, the world that you built around yourself for a few days, the being inside all of this time. And then suddenly it's over and there's this post event blues that settles in. That's so funny. (laughs) You say that. And that's what we're in right now with COVID is Mm -hmm. all that human, that social interaction, that sense of mission, that working towards something big, it's, all been taken away. And I think the reaction for the event professional is to go into that blues and say, Mm -hmm. okay, so now we're just unwinding things. We're trying to figure out how to save money. We're trying to figure out how to um, sort of get by canceling things and whatever else. And, And at some point there has to be that mental shift of saying the, this is the biggest gift I could possibly be given as a professional. And that is, no one expects anything. They expect cancellation. They expect um, arguments about money. They expect all of these these sort of negative things. And if you ask yourself two things, what's the next worst thing that could happen? And you know what? Realize that that didn't happen. Second is, what's the next thing that I can actually do that I've always wanted to do, but never really had the permission to do. And the first question is one that helps you sort of process the negative event of like, this is something terrible that's happened. What's the next worst thing that could have happened that didn't? To get yourself into a mindset of um, trying to think about sort of doing something new. And the second is, look, this is now a chance to try something. And and if it doesn't work, what does it matter? Um, but if you're a great event professional, you'll make it work. You'll try something new. It's a gift. Exactly. It, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it's kind of what I've been doing personally. I'm sure it's what a lot of people have been doing. I've been seeing a lot of people, um, you know, I'm on these Facebook groups and I'm, I'm um, also taking part in a lot of webinars and people, especially these gritty entrepreneurial types are really out there 
pushing new things, creating new programs, pushing their agendas and their opinions out. Um, it's, it's actually really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what would you say, um, to the, you know, knowing what you know now, um, about things, what would you say to the young Bob Bierman, um, the guy who, uh, you know, who got that, uh, that telephone call, uh, or conversely, or maybe it's the same thing. What would you say to young people who, you know, this may not be the best time to jump in, but it may actually be the best mm -hmm. time to jump into this industry. What would you say to them? Um, what I would say is um, you're jumping into an industry where um, as a young person, your answers are as good as anyone else's um, because the, the rule book has been thrown out. The path forward is not clear to anyone. And this is a chance to make a mark at a time when you might not have had a chance in the past um, because the way we've always done it has ruled the day. Um, and being willing to um, understand and respect the perspective that experienced people have and learn from the mistakes they already made can help you not make a few mistakes. Um, but second, um, having the bravery to develop and advocate ideas to try new things um, is something that someone who's just jumping into this industry can do and have a chance for it to actually happen. Um, what At Bloomberg, we launched a um, financial event business in uh, 2009. That was the Great Recession. I mean, in, so launching in the financial market in a recession. So you would say that's the worst possible time to get into the event business. Um, what we decided to do was say, you know what, this is a time when there are a lot of people who are going to be trying to figure out what's the least they can do and collect the most possible money. And that's the time as a new person in the business or as a new entrant into the marketplace to say, um, what can I do as someone who has no expectations and nothing to lose, um, that someone who has everything to lose or a business that has um, the fear of trying new things or the expectation of high profitability, what is it that I can do that they can't? And that list is going to get pretty long. And having the just go try it um, to make that attempt is really the the success sort of factor that I would I would hope to try to tell the young me not to worry about. Um, that this is exactly the time to take risks, not the time to get risk averse. And that sounds like a pretty good place to end. Bob Bierman, you can follow him on Twitter at Bob Bierman, and you can uh, check out his profile on LinkedIn. He's working with G100 Networks, and I wish you a lot of luck with those people and uh, all your, your fun events that you're putting on there. And um, I really, really appreciate you being an awesome business partner over the years and a good friend. And thanks for taking the time for being on the show. Thank you, Terry. Well, that's a wrap for this show. Hey, you can show us some love by subscribing to the show wherever you're listening to us. Subscribing is caring. You can also find us at eventyak.com. The opinions expressed on EventYak are the opinions of our individual guests and not necessarily the organizations to which they're affiliated. EventYak is a production of Moonfish Production Limited. Thank you for listening. Be kind. Be safe. And stand by to stand by.